17 years later, Piper returned to Coventry with an equally difficult task, but this time it was all about resurrection, not destruction. Optimism, not pessimism. Basil Spence's cathedral was, in many ways, a very brilliant thing. It looked back to the arts and crafts and forward to the modern movement. It was a curious mixture of the two, a uh, compromise, if you like. And what John was faced with was an enormous nutmeg grater, 82 feet high by 50 foot uh, uh, across. And um, he just didn't know what to do. He tried an elephant behind it. He tried uh, a, a whale and nothing worked. It all got turned into squares. And then he tried faces and 150 faces in that window it would have been absolutely frightful. And uh, at that time, I had been sent a book by my mother on Bernini. Curious, isn't it? And um, I said to John, oh, well, you've got a trouble here, rather like Bernini did with the end of St. Peter's. And all you can do is to throw a bomb in the middle of it and so that it bursts with colour and unity. And it's very appropriate considering that Coventry was bombed. So if you throw a bomb in the middle of it, and I put it up high, but John said, no, you've got the right idea, but it's the wrong place. I'm going to bring the centre of it right down into the centre. And thank you, that's, that's the thing I'm going to do, yes. And this is what he did. John gave the top, which is entirely blue, a great super simple wash from right to left of a sort of light blue, slightly green. And I thought, oh, but if I double plate all the glass there, I'll uh, have just the right unitive effect in the blue. Because if I do that blue-green right the way through and then put different blues on top of that blue-green, there will be a harmonic running right the way through the glass. And as luck would have it, I went into my glass merchant in London and um, there upstairs, wanting to be used, were crates and crates and crates of machine-made glass that were going to be put into green stop-and-go lamps, you know, for, for vehicles. And uh, they made too much and they didn't know what to do with it. So I got it all cheap as cheap. And I plated the whole of that window with that green glass and nobody knew it at all. Well, of course, technically, of course I did. And uh, that gave a complete unitive thing in all the blues that were used, which were John Piper's blues. And that's what makes the top of that window so beautiful. I did every single piece of painting on the glass using different brushes, sometimes sticks or that sort of thing, to get the effect that John wanted. And every single piece of that glass was by me and no one else. And the design around the edges? They were very important, really. They are a variation on the idea of a medieval border, because when you have something in an architectural situation of very large pieces of colour, then how do you end it either side? You end it by a very small stutter of glass either side, so that the eye doesn't uh, uh, disappear off the window too quickly. It, it bumps into these little pieces of glass either side and gets steadied and then its attention is dropped. That is it. It's like a full stop at the end of a sentence. It's very much, except there must be 2,000 full stops in that particular film, particular window. <laughs> so they decided to have a burst of colour in the middle, this great sunburst as it is. And of course it works. It meant that the picture had to be entirely abstract.
And it came through on a wave of interest and abstraction. In 1956, an exhibition of American art came to London and the final room was full of abstract expressionists. And um, this gave a great uh, surge of interest once again in abstraction. So they caught the right moment with the right idea and did what I think is probably the finest stained glass window in England. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God.